Medal of Honor was once a genre-defining series that was beloved by many. It showed the world that there was a market for epic historical shooters in a sea of over-the-top science fiction games. The first four games in the series were highly successful and ushered in a new era of World War II shooters. Every year there'd be a couple of new FPS games set during the Second World War. One of these games was the first title in the now giant Call of Duty series. Comprised of a lot of ex-Medal of Honor devs, the game was internally called Medal of Honor Killer. The accuracy of that nickname has proven itself over the years. Since the release of Call of Duty 1, the Medal of Honor series has never fully returned to its glory days. EA would release quite a few titles in the Medal of Honor series. Some reviewing better than others, but the general public was growing tired of the same old linear World War II shooters in the mid-2000s. EA's answer to this was a bold and unique take on a stale formula. A game that dared to do something different and should be applauded for it. A game they'd call Medal of Honor Airborne. EA Los Angeles started development of Airborne in late 2004. They wanted to create a game that would revolutionize the Medal of Honor franchise. The team decided early on that they wanted to focus on paratrooper based gameplay. They aimed for the player to have complete control over their parachute and their landing location. This emphasis on player choice and freedom had a significant influence on almost all other systems in the game. The most important thing for me is, is as a player is reading the encounter from above. You know, it, it's very overwhelming when, when you get pushed out of the plane or when you jump out of the plane and you look down and you see this entire level beneath you and, and you say, where do I go? The team had to design levels in a totally different way than they were used to. As we started prototyping different forms of drop zones, uh, we started with uh, little pocket encounters that were scattered around a map. You can't have a completely open space and expect the player to, to have fun. When you landed in a dead spot, you found yourself hiking a ways to, to get somewhere. So that evolved into a, um, a more hub and sector form of level design that uh, it's, it's very apparent to the player when he's in the parachute coming down. You can look around the map and you can see distinct zones and areas and battle lines. And from there you can make educated choices about how you want to land and how you want to engage. With the open map design of Airborne, the development team had to completely rethink the AI systems for both the Axis and Allied forces. Unlike older Medal of Honor titles that relied on tightly scripted events for AI behavior, Airborne required a more dynamic approach. The designers developed a system called Affordance to address this challenge. Instead of using triggers as in previous games, they encoded information into the environment to guide the AI's actions. This allowed the AI to intelligently respond to various situations, such as identifying optimal cover, positioning themselves relative to the player, executing flanking maneuvers, and launching coordinated attacks. To keep the player immersed into the game, there are no loading screens from the moment you jump out of the plane until the moment you complete the mission. This means that all cinematics are done in-engine. The team used motion capture and actor performances to create believable scenes. The game is built on a heavily modified Unreal Engine 3 that could utilize HDR, per pixel lighting and dynamic shadows. Resulting in one of the better looking games of the early 7th gen consoles, in my opinion. The game had to not only look great, but also sound great. To achieve this, the devs went above and beyond and organized a weapon shoot to capture audio from dozens of authentic weapons. They had over 30 different microphones to capture every minute detail. In previous games, when a weapon was fired, a gunshot sample would be played and the volume would increase or decrease based on the distance between the player and the shooter. For Airborne, the team used different layers to achieve a more realistic effect. And so when you hear an NPC firing in our game, if he's very far away, you're hearing the, the distant uh, elements that we captured at the weapon shoot. As he's getting closer, we're starting to blend in the midfield elements. As he's getting really close, now you've got a third layer of the, of the near field with gun mech in it. And so it's the same gunshot and we're not trying to artificially create the distance. We actually captured it in that way. After capturing all the different sounds, they would blend them together in the studio to create a seamless sense of distance from near to far. And I have to say, they did a great job. They even went as far as recording audio from an actual C-47 airplane that flew during multiple missions above enemy territory. 
It's one of the most combat experienced airplanes that is still functioning today. And for the music, Medal of Honor's original composer Michael Giacchino reprised his role. They aimed to reinvent the music as much as they reinvented the gameplay. Michael wanted this score to be a little bit more mature and uneasy, adding a sense of mystery, drama and tension to the music. Personally, I think it works well for the game, but the individual songs aren't as memorable as the older ones. Giacchino does deserve praise for taking risks and not playing it safe. That wraps up the development details for Airborne. Now let's jump into the story, shall we? The story follows US paratrooper Boyd Travers across six different missions. Before each mission, you receive a briefing detailing your safe zones and targets. These briefings are presented to you from a first-person perspective, adding to the immersion of the game. The pre-jump cinematics are also very well done, adding to the game's sense of urgency and camaraderie. Here, the audio really gets to shine. However, once you jump out of the plane, there's almost no narrative to be found. There are no characters to grow attached to, just the nameless AI teammates fighting alongside you. It's such a missed opportunity. The game didn't need to delve as deeply as a Brothers in Arms game for instance, but it would have benefited from a stronger overarching narrative. Airborne can feel a bit soulless as a result. The cinematics during missions are well done, but for some reason the game decides to leave the first person perspective at certain points. I find it to be an odd choice since the game is fully first person otherwise. It really takes me out of the immersion. In summary, Airborne isn't a game you should play for its story, as there's barely one to speak of. The gameplay is far more interesting to discuss, so let's dive into that. Before every mission you get to choose your loadout. It's a small selection at first, and you unlock more options as the game progresses. I really appreciate this feature because it adds a significant amount of replay value to the levels. Do you opt for a sniper and drop onto high ground? Or do you choose a shotgun and drop in close to the enemy, engaging them head on? This freedom of choice extends to the parachute mechanics. Once you leave the plane, you decide where to land. For example, in the first level, we need to take out all enemies in and around the town hall. One approach is to land in one of the back alleys, fight your way to the building and enter through the cellar. Another approach is to land on top of the tower, clear it and enter the town hall through the front doors. A third way to tackle this objective is to land on top of one of the roofs next to the building and enter through an open window. These are only some of the options available to you. My point is, EA Los Angeles actually delivered on their promise of a non-linear shooter. It was really quite a novel idea, since it would take another decade before we were all jumping out of airplanes in Battle Royale games. There are a couple of objectives to complete on each map usually involving tasks like blowing up anti-aircraft guns or other high-value targets. The order in which you tackle these objectives is entirely up to you. However, once you've landed on the ground, the open-ended nature of the game starts to show some cracks. There are a couple of linear sections within the maps that can only be completed in one or two ways. It's a shame, because I just showed you how great some parts of the map can be. After these objectives are completed, there's usually a rendezvous point that opens up a new area. Generally, there's a big set piece here and a final confrontation to complete the level. Medal of Honor is a shooter first and foremost, so let's take a look at its gunplay. While it's a mixed bag for me personally, let's begin with the positives. Firstly, the weapons sound fantastic. Every shot you fire feels like it carries significant weight, especially when combined with the physics system. The physics are quite a bit over the top, but personally I love that in my shooters. Secondly, the game features quite an in-depth leaning system, allowing you to peek over and around corners, which adds a tactical dimension to the gameplay. And thirdly, the game uses an upgrade system. As you eliminate enemies using a specific weapon, you gain experience points with it. Once the blue bar on the right is filled up, you upgrade the gun to the next level, unlocking an attachment. This is a great incentive to use all the weapons available in the game, again adding to that replay value. I have a problem with this system though, and here I'll start discussing some of the negatives with the gunplay. Some of these attachments make absolutely no sense. For example, the final upgrade for the shotgun is a bayonet, which you will never use. 
Another example is the final upgrade for the Springfield Sniper. You unlock a rifled grenade launcher, which makes zero sense for that weapon. And for the G43, the second unlock is a scope, which is fine, but you cannot detach it, forcing you to play the weapon in a certain way. The idea for the upgrades is fine, but the execution is baffling to me. Another frustrating aspect of the gunplay are the controls, on PC at least. Every time you aim down sights, you are forced to stand still, unless you press the shift button, making it extremely awkward to move and shoot. I have a feeling this wasn't as bad on consoles, but on PC it took a lot of getting used to. Overall, the gunplay is decent, but it's hindered by these mechanics. And that's the recurring theme throughout the game. For every brilliant moment, there is something that leaves me scratching my head. One of my favorite moments in the entire game occurs during Operation Market Garden. As you exit the plane, the hauntingly beautiful song Arnhem from Medal of Honor Frontline begins to play. Time seems to slow down for a while. And then the game does a complete 180 in the next level by introducing Storm Elite units that hipfire MG42s and require multiple headshots to take down. It just doesn't align with the tone set by the earlier levels. Especially considering that EA Los Angeles had a historical advisor on the team. But when all is said and done, I believe Airborne gets more things right than wrong. Before we wrap up the gameplay section, I want to mention the awesome use of verticality in the game. Fights don't just take place on a flat piece of land, but on top of roofs, towers, scaffolding and more. Another cool feature I haven't mentioned yet are the skill drops. They are indicated by a hanging white parachute. These are hard to reach locations of which there are 5 per map. They don't give you a gameplay advantage, but they are fun to collect. Oh, and you can kick grenades. Why don't more games feature this? Alright, that's the gameplay covered. Let's take a look at the visuals and the different versions of the game. When I first played this game over 15 years ago, I remember being blown away by the graphics. And playing it now, it is still really impressive what the team managed to pull off. The textures look crisp and the environments are really detailed. Just take a look at the ruined streets of Nijmegen. I also really enjoy all the stuff that's going on in the sky. You can see planes, tracers, paratroopers, explosions, all kinds of things. And the lighting looks pretty great as well. You can see the light bounds of the streets in this nighttime mission. Also, the player animations look great. The only thing I noticed were some pop-in issues and the AI teammates. They look a bit uncanny, like they're made of plastic. But those are my only complaints really. EA LA knocked it out of the park on the presentation front. The game released on PC, Xbox 360 and PS3. With the PC being the best version, with higher frame rates and resolutions. If you plan on playing this game on a console, the Xbox version is your best bet since the PS3 has quite a bit of trouble keeping a consistent frame rate. And that's all I have to say on the game, really. You would think that a game with so many innovations would be a certified success, right? Let's take a look at its reception and legacy. The game scored in the high 70s, with reviewers saying it was a step in the right direction for the franchise. IGN even mentioned it as one of the best games in the franchise since a long while. However, despite the positive reception, sales were disappointing for EA leading to the decision to end the Medal of Honor series set in the World War II era. If this game had been released a year earlier, I believe it would have done a lot better. You see, in the same year Medal of Honor's direct competitor released one of the most impactful shooters of all time, Call of Duty Modern Warfare. People were tired of the World War II setting and in comes Call of Duty with a fresh coat of paint and an innovative multiplayer mode. Remember when the first Call of Duty was dubbed the Medal of Honor Killer? In the end, they did just that. Medal of Honor received the reboot treatment in 2010, which did okay, but its sequel Warfighter was critically panned in 2012. Since then, there has been little activity in the series, except for a VR game. So that's it. EA has doubled down on its Battlefield franchise and Call of Duty is going as strong as ever. Will we ever see a Medal of Honor game again? I don't know. But I just wanted to make this video to celebrate the boldness and innovation EA Los Angeles brought to this series. It's something that's becoming rarer and rarer these days, especially from EA titles. Hopefully, we'll have the chance to hear that iconic Medal of Honor theme once again someday in the future. 
thank you so much for watching this video all the way through. I really appreciate all the support I've been getting lately and I'd love to talk to you in the comment section down below. If you enjoy this type of content and want to see more, consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Alright, that's all for now. I'll catch you in the next one. Peace!